A pleasant good evening to all those that have joined in with us tonight here at the Central Church of Christ in beautiful Clearwater, Florida. We're so looking forward to another good lesson tonight. And thank you for giving us your presence and that you're watching online tonight. We're so thankful for you and grateful for your presence. Tonight we want to look at the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God. And we'll be looking at Ephesians 3 verses 10 and 11. Ephesians 3 verses 10 and 11. But before we get started, let's have a word of prayer, if you will. Father, thank you for once again allowing us this opportunity to study more about thee and thy word and especially your eternal purpose. Father, we're so thankful that you have saw fit to instruct us as mankind to be able to uh, lead us in the right direction that will be able to lead us toward heaven to be with thee and thy dear son. Father, we're so thankful for what he has done by coming to this earth to live and to die for us. But Father, we ask thee to, to be with those that we know that are sick and afflicted at this time. Watch over them, help them to a better portion of health. Father, we are so thankful for the doctors that are doing all they can to help Teresa out and so much to help her to feel better. Father, we know that there are so many others that uh, are in need of thy tender love and care. Tim Adams and Daryl Broking and, and so many more. And Father, we know that you know them and that you'll watch over them and help them in every way. But Father, we know that there are still many that are grieving over the loss of loved ones. Be with them, comfort them, and may they look into thee and thy word for that strength, for that comfort. But Father, we ask thee to be with us in our class tonight, as we study thy word, forgive us and in the end save us if we've been found faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. How can we possibly comprehend the very love and the power, the omniscience, or the exact details of our Heavenly Father? At best, our efforts are feeble and inadequate to speak of God's eternal purpose. But I want us to first focus our attention on that grand statement that was made by the faithful servant who endured some great persecution and frequent imprisonment, and that's the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says in Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11. In writing to the church in Ephesus, he says, To the intent that now unto the principalities, and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hugo McCord, in his New Testament translation of the everlasting gospel, renders verse 11 as according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And I think that's rightly so. Brother Garland Elkins, a, a great brother in Christ, he stated it once very powerful, powerfully. He said, it is as though the Apostle Paul takes us into the very throne room of the Godhead and thus allows us to witness the sacred, sacred three in divine counsel concerning the spiritual welfare of all of mankind. Let's stop for a moment and just look at the context and the history of what was written there in Ephesians 3, verses 10 and 11. You know, some of the foundation thoughts that were laid previously in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians gives us just a few of the facts that led to his writing this in chapter 3, in verses 10 and 11. In chapter 1, in verse 3, he acknowledged that the very spiritual blessings that can only be found in Christ Jesus were a major thrust of his Ephesian letter. In verse 4, we learned that our Father chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Simply stated here that God's people became Christians. They left the world and the worldly matters. They were added to the Lord's church and they were able to enjoy the blessings of being in Christ. 
when they obeyed the very simple and magnificent steps that were prescribed by the Savior himself. And as far as Almighty God is concerned, the salvation of man washed clean by the blood of the Lamb began long before the moment of our taking that final consummating step which places us in Christ. In fact, notice the declaration of Simon Peter in 1 Peter 1 and verse 20, where he says, Who, that is Christ, verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. You know, Paul wrote to the church at Rome regarding Christ and his followers when he said, For whom he did for you know, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, among whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, then he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans 8. 29 and 30. You know, Paul even taught Timothy that God had purposed and planned our salvation. He called us even before the very world began. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9, he says, Who hath saved us and called us with a, un, for with, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You see, God foreordained us unto adoption as sons through Jesus Christ unto himself, Ephesians 1, 5. You know, even before man even walked on this earth, God already had in mind a plan and a purpose. And he purposed for obedient ones to be able to live forever in heaven with him, according to the good pleasure of his will, Ephesians 1 and verse 5. Oh, it's not because of man or his goodness, nor because God was obligated to offer salvation to man. It was not that God saw our faith and our good works, our obedience or anything deserving but it was God's will, his desire. It was his purpose. It was because of his mercy and his grace, the very purpose of a loving, almighty God and Father. In Ephesians 1 and verse 6, it talks about the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. You know, Paul emphasizes that... <clears throat> that God freely offers and extends to everyone the riches of his grace. In Romans 5, verses 8 and 9, he, we read there, that, But God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we are then saved from wrath through him. You might remember the words from heaven regarding that, on that mount of transfiguration when God had said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mark 1.11 You know, the inspired record really continues in verse 7 of Ephesians 1 that says, In whom we have redemption through His blood. In whom? Christ. We have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. You see, God made his, his purpose known to us, verse 9. And when the time was right and would make salvation a reality through Jesus Christ, verse 10. You see, our inheritance is purpose. It's, it's planned and then executed according to the will of God, verse 11. You know, Paul reminds the Ephesians that they had heard and and had trusted in the, the word of truth, verse 13 of Ephesians 1. 
and that God, the Father of glory, would give them the wisdom and the knowledge of Him. Verse 17. The hope of His calling and the riches of His glory, of His inheritance. Verse 18. But also His mighty power. Verse 19. In verse 20 of Ephesians 1, God's love is shown in the gift of His Son, but His power is demonstrated in the very resurrection of his son. His plan and his purpose are further made known as we learn that his son is at the father's right hand, verse 20. You see, God put all things under Christ's feet and he gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. You know, the Ephesians have been dead and their trespasses and sins and they walked according to the world. But in Christ Jesus, we learn that they were made alive. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. In verses 4 and 5 of chapter 2, we find that God, rich in mercy and love, had brought them out of that sin and raised them up to be in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 2 and verse 7, we also read that in the ages to come, that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Oh, what an awesome statement, huh? I mean, developing the very purpose and the plan of God, we are informed that in the future, as time is not measured by our Creator, that the rich, the abounding, the exceeding, abundant grace of God through Christ Jesus will then be more clearly known to us. It is really and truly an unfathomable gift. Chapter 2, verse 8. In verse 10 of chapter 2 of Ephesians, God ordained before that is obedient, submissive followers that are created in Christ Jesus should walk in Him. You see, without Christ, all of us are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. Verse 12. Then in verses 13 and 14, we find that with Christ, who is our peace, all is able to be made nigh by the very blood of Jesus Christ. You know, Christ broke down that very wall of partition, abolished the eternity, but then reconciled us back unto God in one body, and that is the church. Verses 14 through 16. And that through Christ, we all have access to the Father, verse 18. You know, we are nothing but fellow citizens with the saints, verse 19. And we were built upon that very chief cornerstone of Jesus Christ, verse 20. But look at verse 22. We learn there that God's people are built together for a habitation of God. And then for this cause, in chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul says, regarding what he's writing to these brethren, how interesting it is how that the great apostle Paul is overflowing with these facts and topics and grand praise for the Father and can hardly even complete a sentence without going to some exciting and valuable related fact. His prayer for the Ephesians there in Ephesians 1 and verse 15 are interrupted by an emphasis on the very majesty and the power of God in raising Christ from the dead and in making the Gentiles the fellow heirs of the promise. You see, you've set this point that Paul then adds inspired thoughts about the revelation of God that was made known to him, the mystery, if you will, of Christ. Thus far in this letter, he has revealed how blessed that the Ephesians were with that new relationship to God and, and to God's people. He says what they had heard there in verse 2 of chapter 3, or what they could understand in verse 4, of chapter 3, that many who had lived previously are not privy to that which was revealed through Paul in 
the other apostles there in verse 5, that all could be a part of that same body, partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 6. You know, the humble Paul then speaks of himself as a minister, who was less than the least of all saints, a preacher of the unsearchable riches of Christ, there in verses 7 through 9 of chapter 3. The gospel of Christ was that which Paul preached, that enlightened, that made all men to be able to see that which God had purposed and cherished from all eternity until it was revealed in the fullness of time, Galatians 4.4. 4. But look at verse 10. He said that it might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. You see, the very purpose or the plan of God is developed and accomplished in the church according to the eternal purpose of God. From before the foundation of the world to the time when sin had entered into the world, through the ages of man's history, God had unfolded it step by step, his plan for redeeming mankind. You know, so, so we see that Christ and the church were in God's plan from the very beginning. It was Kaufman who states that Paul might have written, well, we will shout the gospel message to the highest heavens and extol the glory of the church as the demonstration of God's manifold wisdom to the highest beings in the universe. In study of this passage of scripture, we can find out that that word manifold speaks of the very multicolored or much variegated wisdom of God. You know, there is little doubt that Paul spoke of that infinite diversity and breathtaking beauty of the wisdom of Jehovah God. According to the eternal purpose, he says, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, verse 11. All that points to the very one, that is Jesus, who is the very center and the circumference of all things. The eternal purpose was conceived or made in Jehovah, attaining its fulfillment and only through him, that is Jesus, in the church. It has been an, a mistake to teach Ephesians 3 and verse 10, referring to the obligation of the church to be evangelistic. And while this fact is true, it is likewise true that this passage is speaking of the church in, in existence and existing as God had authorized, demonstrating God's wisdom. By the church, it is by the church that after all the ages, that the prophecies now have been, having been fulfilled, that the Messiah had now come to the earth, climatically was rejected and crucified, thus purchased the church with his own blood that was shed on that cross, and that the church was established on Pentecost Day in Acts chapter 2, and that the wisdom of God is now so powerfully demonstrated. Oh, how many times have you heard that people would say that, oh, the, the church is not important. There, there, there's no salvation in the church. I, I beg to differ. You see, the church is very important. And salvation can only be found in the church. I'm not talking about in this building. I'm talking about the family of God. We cannot oversteam the very body of Christ, which is the church. We cannot emphasize too much the bride of Christ, a very vital part of God's eternal purpose. And so appropriately, Paul then states, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, there in chapter 3, verse 14. The eternal purpose of God our Heavenly Father, with infinite power and His knowledge, knew that created man would thus become disobedient at one time or another, thus would then need a Savior. In view of this fact, 
our loving and merciful Father, even before time and creation, purpose to be able to save man. God could see, if he desired to do so, that his only begotten son, sacrificed for the sins of the world, was the one who made it possible for man to be reconciled, made clean, and washed by his shed blood. Jehovah God willingly offered redemption to sinful mankind, making it possible for all to be his adopted children. This grand theme is developed throughout the history of man. From the patriarchal age, continuing through the Mosaic age, we then are led to the Messiah according to God's eternal purpose, and thus the New Testament, the Christian age in which we live today. You know, Jesus Christ is that preeminent one. From all eternity, he has been the very focal point and the focal hub of Jehovah's plan and purpose. It was Leon Stancliffe in his commentary who stated it very well this way. He says, as the word of God, Christ shared in the original purpose for the father to have a family that would live with him in eternity. That purpose has not been defeated by Satan in any way. It is living and well through the preaching of the gospel and the fellowship of the church. God's eternal purpose will be carried out. The church is the center, the core of God's eternal purpose. Through claims, or even though claims are made that the church is a mere afterthought of our Creator due to the rejection of His Son while here on earth, these are nothing but more than false assertions. The church was in God's plan. The church is the saved body of Christ, of which Christ is the head. When viewed with these indisputable facts, our appreciation, our esteem of the very body of Christ, the church that was purchased with his blood, thus increases. Andrew Connolly, a great preacher in the yesteryear, correctly stated that Ignorant and foolish men sneer at it as a non-essential institution, but that God's people must not faint at such attacks. They must realize that regardless of what happens to anyone, that the church cannot fail because it is a part of God's eternal purpose. And God is going to see it carried out. Attitudes are often expressed by men today such a, that, well, there are good people in all churches. And of course there are. Or that you should attend the church of your choice. Or you don't have to be a member of the church of Christ to be saved. Well, what is it that really prompts men to have such views? Well, a few of the reasons include the lack of respect for biblical authority. Number two, it's because of the lack of the insist in its insufficient love for Christ. And thus the overemphasis of what it is that men say, but not what God said. And thus, number four, it's it's just totally ignorance. You know, the importance of the church is shown in, in its planning. You know, it was about 4,000 B.C. that we have a, our first hint of the Savior and the church and the kingdom to come. It was about 1900 B.C. that God promised that through Christ all nations would be blessed. In fact, in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, he said, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. 
and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now to Abraham and his seed, the promises were made. He had said, and uh, he, he saith not, and, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.16, and Ephesians 1, verse 3, and verses 22 and 23 as well. And about 800 years before that first Pentecost, which would follow Jesus' resurrection, we read Isaiah's prophetic words, that it shall come to pass in the last days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. You know, it was Daniel who also spoke of the kingdom and the church, which will never be destroyed in Daniel 2, verse 44, some 600 years before the church was even established. Four years before Pentecost, which the church was established, Matthew records the words of John, the, the harbinger, the forerunner of Christ, when he said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's nearby. It's just right around the corner. Matthew 3, 1 through 2. In Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Over a year before the church was built, the statement of Jesus, I will build my church, is found in Matthew 16, 18, which was spoken about a year before the, even the church began. That profound, undeniable declaration of Jesus that's recorded in Mark 9 and verse 1 is that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power, which was also made a few months before the church actually came into existence. In Luke chapter 23, he gives us a record of the crucifixion of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke 24, he documents his resurrection from the dead on the third day. And then 40 days later, our Lord ascended. 40 days. Our Lord ascended, Acts 1.8, telling his disciples that they should tarry in Jerusalem that the power, Mark 9, 1, came upon those apostles as he prophesied to them that the church of Christ was then built, Acts 2, according to God's eternal purpose. I want you to consider with me for just a moment. Would Jehovah had taken over 4,000 years to lay a foundation and unfold his plan and give detailed prophecies through his servants and fulfill those prophecies for something that is not important? Would the Son of God give his life blood for something that was not essential? Would Jesus defy the very gates of Hades and death for something unimportant? For what some call just another denomination, of which it's not? Surely we see the value of the church by the importance that Jehovah God places upon it by the price that the Son of God paid for it. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he had purposed in his own blood. Acts 20 and verse 28. What is it that is right about the Lord's church? You know, preachers who declare the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 26 and 27, must be able to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffered in doctrine, 2 Timothy 4, 2. At times it is mandatory for us to expose and draw attention to 
mark those false teachers and their ways, Romans 6, 17, 16, 17. There are conditions that exist that are not pleasing to God. But we must also draw attention to the precious things that are right with the church for which Christ died and of which we can be members. You see, the Church of Christ was established in the right time, at the right place. It was in the last days, as Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. It was in Jerusalem, again Isaiah 2, Zechariah 1, 16, Acts chapter 2. The Church of Christ had the right builder, Jesus, the Son of God. When he said, I will build, Matthew 16, 18. He promised the church, Mark 9, 1. And he, it was not just anyone. Psalm 127, verse 1, Matthew 15, 13. You see, the church of our Lord had the right builder. That is Jesus, the Son of God. He has the right standard of authority as the Word of God. Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, 18. It's the Holy Bible, His words, 2 Timothy 3. 16 and 17. Why the Church of Christ has the right type of government or the organization. It's not our choice. God specified the choice. Acts 14, 23, and Titus 1 and 5 and following. The Church of Christ has the right plan of salvation, the entrance requirements. You see, God had specified that the church must comply to hearing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, to believe completely, John 8, 24, Hebrews 11, 6, to repent of our sin, uh, Luke 13, 3, and Acts 17, or Acts 3, 19, and Acts 17, 30. Confess Christ, Matthew 10, 32, and 33, and Romans 10, 9, and 10, to be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38 and Mark 16.16, 16, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 22.16 and many other verses. That the church of our Lord worships in the right way. The God authorized ingredients is to be done by the apostles' doctrine, their teaching, Acts 2.42. To be giving the contribution as prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. The partake of the Lord's Supper as memorial of that death of Jesus Christ, Acts 20, verse 7. To pray to God through Christ, Acts 2, 42. And thus to sing, and to sing only, at Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16, without the instrumental music. The church of our Lord does not only, does only God-authorized work, and thus it's the right work, preaching the gospel, 1 Thessalonians 1, 8. Edifying the saints, Ephesians 4, 12 through 16. And thus helping the needy, Acts 6, 1 through 6. You see, the Lord's church is not another denomination. It's not even a denomination. A, denom a denomination is, is only a part of the whole. But the church we read about in the Bible is the, you can capitalize the word the, that article, body. Not a mere part of anything created by man. What actions or attitudes have brought so many denominations in, into existence? Well, that's by following man, not by following Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. By changing or adding or subtracting from the very word of God, Revelation 2, 18 and 19. The selfish interest or the seeking to please the, their own whims and their fancies, not to please God and to serve and obey Him, Acts 5.29. Thus, the result is nothing but chaos and confusion, isn't it? In the first century, as well as today, confusion did exist, 1 Corinthians 1, 10-13, that the truth which has the power to save was rejected, by so many, Galatians 1, 6-9, that Christ is not exalted when man and his doctrine are elevated above the doctrine of Christ, Ephesians 1, 21. You see, denominationalism must be opposed. Though popular with mankind, it is contrary to the very will of God. It is unacceptable to Almighty God 
and it will result in one soul being lost eternally. What is wrong with denominations? Well, all denominations are unscriptural in origin, Matthew 15, 13. They're unscriptural in name. They would actually name themselves after a, a, a saint or after a somebody else that's out there. They're on uh, Acts 4.12. They're on scriptural even in doctrine, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, Matthew 15, 7 through 9. They're on scriptural in their worship, Ephesians 5, 19. Even Acts 20, verse 7 tells us. But they're on scriptural in their organization as well. We know that even the Roman Catholic Church, that they are doing all that they can uh, to... Uh, base their idea from the Roman hierarchy altogether. They're even destructed to the soul, Romans 16, 17. Denominations are just religions of men, and they're sinful because they oppose God's specific purpose and plan to redeem mankind, Ephesians 3, 11. Why, they even violate the Lord's Prayer for unity, John 17, 20 and 21. This, they destroy the inspired, complete Word of God as the sole authority in the matters of religion. Unbelievable. They All they do is create confusion. They make God's plan unreliable, and they cause many to reject God's offer of salvation. Why? They make Jesus a foolish, contradictory hypocrite. Matthew 15, 1 through 15. Why, they even deny the plain, undeniable teaching of the Bible about the exclusive one body of Christ. Why, they even make the death of the Son of God worthless, unprofitable, Acts 20, 28. Why, they even destroy the Lord's plan of salvation and try to turn it into some kind of a social gospel. And they substitute many ways and plans that supposedly can save but leads people down the wrong path. They honor men. They honor the methods. They honor the nations, not Jesus as the Christ, Acts eleven twenty six and Acts 4, 12. So really, what does this mean to mankind today? Well, we live in an awesome time, don't we? I mean, we live in an awesome country where we are free to be able to worship God in spirit and in true, John 4, 24. Our blessings are rich and plentiful. But our time, if you will, is different from the time of all who have gone before. Well, they were not able to be able to have the inspired record in its entirety, entirety like we do. And uh, they, they didn't have the ability to read of the purpose and the the plan of God unfolding from creation all the way to this age. We have the benefit of the Old Testament prophecy concisely being given and, and to see the all-powerful Father's hand in the fulfillment of those prophecies as recorded in the New Testament. You know, John records this power-packed, he emotionally-filled declaration when he says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon all of us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. First John 3 one and two. You know, Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, and he spoke of their new life in Christ. He says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you that has been baptized into Christ have therefore put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Today, we're greatly honored to be the children of God, adopted into the family of God according to God's eternal purpose. We need to remember that. We're privileged far beyond that which we deserve to be able to have the opportunity to have our evil ways just washed away, if you will, and no longer to be guilty or chargeable 
for those transgressions. You know, God wants to save all men from sin and death. First Timothy 2, 3 and 4, Romans 6, 23. But he will only save those who are in the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, that is the eternal purpose of God. You know, there are many reasons why we can know the church of our Lord, the church of Christ, is the New Testament church, because we can read about it, of uh, that in the Bible. We can read about the Lord's church in the Bible, Romans 16, 16. Its founder is Christ himself, as we said, said earlier, that he was the one that built that mouth, Matthew 16, 18. That Christ is exalted as the only head of the church, Colossians 1, 18. The church has no creed but the Bible and no name but Christ, 1 Peter 4, 16, Acts eleven twenty six, And he speaks where the Bible speaks and we are to speak where the Bible speaks and silent where the Bible is silent, 1 Peter 4, 11. You know, worship is patterned strictly only after the New Testament example that we find in God's Word, John 4, 24, Acts 20, verse 7. Ephesians 5.19, and it pleads for the unity of all believers in Christ, and it teaches that scriptural unity can be achieved on doctrinal matters when the Bible is the only source of authority, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. Its aim is to save souls by leading the world, every creature, to Christ by the gospel, Matthew 28. 18 through 19, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Romans 1, 16. Its future is eternal glory with Christ as well, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. I hope that you want to be a part of the Lord's church, the one and only, of which Christ is the head and the church is the body of Christ, and that we can be a part of that and be able to know that salvation is found in the church of our Lord. I hope that you'll make that decision even tonight. Once you call us, write us, text us, let us know. Help us to help you to understand more about the Lord's church and its unity, and it's, it's different from any other church that is out there in the world today that are just really denominations. The Lord's church is pre-denomination. And I hope that you'll understand that and that you will obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by your faith and believing that Jesus is the Christ, by your repentance of your sins, by making that good confession that Jesus is the Christ, and then go down into the waters of baptism to have those sins washed away, Acts twenty two sixteen, to be added to the Lord's church, Acts two forty seven, thus to become a child of God in the family of God, thus to have heaven as your home one day. Maybe you're already a follower of Christ, maybe a disciple of Christ, maybe you've already obeyed the gospel is what I'm trying to say, but maybe you've fallen away. Come back, be restored back to that first love of Jesus Christ and make things right before it's everlasting too late. We hope that you will even tonight. Let us know. Let's go to God in prayer as we finish out. Father, thank you for once again allowing us this opportunity. But Father, we are so thankful for your eternal purpose that you have planned out even before the foundation of the world and that you have given us a hope when you created us, you you created us with the ability to choose, to make the, the right choices, but there's that possibility of the wrong choices. But then because of the wrong choices, you gave us an eternal purpose and a way that we can redeem ourselves through your son and his blood on that cross. Father, be, we ask thee to be with each one of us, to watch over us. Save us if we've been found faithful, Help those who need to obey the gospel, even tonight. In Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Thank you for tuning in. I hope it was beneficial to you as it was to me. 
about the eternal purpose of God. We hope to see you Sunday at 1030 for our worship, and then again that night for our evening worship at 5 o'clock. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.